I want you to go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1 again, please. I've entitled up my presentation today, What Will You Say? Now, in this past week, on Wednesday night, in actual fact, I mentioned about the fact that you are going to be brought before two councils. So to get you started off, I want to just take you to 2 Peter chapter 1, and I want you to look at verse 16 again. And I'm always intrigued by the way in which Peter put the whole thing together and how he starts off his, his thought. He says, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, I wonder how many of you have ever really taken note of what is really going on here. And um, keep your finger there, and I want you to jump with me to Matthew, please. And I want you to go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. But now I'm going to do something. You're going to Matthew 17, but I want you to start reading 17 with me by looking at the last verse of Matthew chapter 16. Now remember that the Word of God has been compiled with the different chapters that we have, and they sometimes we're giving them num you know, numbers like. Matthew chapter 17 verse 1 but it doesn't always mean that verse 1 was actually the first thought and I actually want you to look at this because Matthew 16 verse 28 says and this is Christ speaking I tell you I tell you some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom now this is a literal chapter. Matthew is a historical record of what Christ had done while he was on earth in the three and a half years of his ministry, an accurate record by Matthew. But here Christ makes a statement to the crowds around him that there are some who are standing in his presence today that will see him coming in power and great glory. My question is, are they still here today? Because as far as I'm concerned, Christ has not yet come in power and great glory, has he? I want you to know, just keep your finger there, but remember you've got it in two places, but I just want you to jump to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, you are given a clear indication that... Christ is going to come. He's telling people things. And there's a lot of things that take place. And one of the things that takes place, Matthew 24 verse 29, says immediately after the stress of those days, and we're talking about the 1,260 years, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And we have all of this incredible information. And these are literal, actual events that take place. There was a time when the sun lost its light and the moon was blood red and the stars fell from the sky. Really. Not symbolically, not um, um, as an algorithm or anything. It was reality. It really happened. But then I want you to notice, right after that, verse 30. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven... And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now if you read this here, you will understand that Christ is saying that what is to come, which is power and great glory, is still to come. It hasn't yet come. And yet, in Matthew chapter 16... Christ says that there are people standing in his presence that day that will actually experience the, the coming in power and great glory. Now remember that in 2 Peter, we just read there 
that Peter made it very clear that they did not put together cleverly devised um, presentations. So please go back there to Peter, chapter 1. For, verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But then he says this, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So, Keeping your finger there, jump back to Matthew chapter 16. Christ says there are some present today who will actually see me in my second coming, coming in power and great glory. Here in Peter, it sounds as if he is testifying to being one of those people who saw Jesus coming in power and great glory. Do you understand that? That's what he says. Now, right after that, we have Matthew 17. And in Matthew 17, we have verse 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. Now, this got me thinking. After six days of what? After what six days? It's six days after his announcement that some present will see me coming in power and great glory. Six days later. Are you with me? Our attention is drawn to six days later. He does something. He took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So who's in the picture here? Who's themselves here? It's Jesus, Peter, James, and John. Four of them going up the mountain. He's just said, standing among you, there are those who are going to see me coming in power and great glory. Do you understand that? So now we're starting to figure out who are the witnesses that will see him coming in power and great glory. Well, so far we have Peter, James, and John. Okay. Verse 2. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. <laughs> I always smile at this. I mean, I think Mo Peter was just a house builder. You know, He just wanted to build houses. Verse 5. While he was still speaking. Listen, dear friends. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. What did Peter, James, and John just see? They saw Christ as he would appear in the second coming in power and great glory. They saw him literally as he is going to be when he comes. How do I know this? I'd like you to go back to 2 Peter.
Now remember, dear friends, and there's a reason why I'm putting this together, because I'm, I'm asking you this question. What will you say? What will you say? I'm busy putting a presentation together on, and I'm still thinking of a title, but I want to call it The Greatest Sting Ever. Now you know what the sting is? Or maybe I should say the greatest con ever. Uh, are you starting to get the picture? Dear friends, I want to tell you that in the future there is going to be a revelation of the greatest sting ever. That if you are not clear on the second coming and what it's all about, you will be deceived. You will be conned. You will be stung. So what I'm asking you to do is not be clever. Because Peter says being clever is not what it's all about. And sometimes we as a church come across very clever. But you can be very clever and unprepared. Because Christ says, my coming will be like a thief. And some of you are going to be caught naked, unprepared. Some of you are going to be five virgins who weren't wise. And I'm telling you ahead of time, because the ten virgins is not talking about unbelievers, the ten virgins is talking about believers who claim to be waiting for the bridegroom's coming. But five were ready and five weren't. And Peter is making very clear, and I want you to listen to it, because he says he's not talking about, I want to tell you that we are witnesses to the baptism of Christ. No, he doesn't say that. He clearly defines what he was witness to. He says there in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. So here's Peter, James and John saying, but Peter is the spokesman. We are not telling you something that we heard from somebody else. Because most of us sitting here are people who will only say what we have heard. And unless you hear the right thing, you're not going to be ready for the sting. It's hard for me to almost believe that the whole world will wander after the beast. That if it was possible, even the elect of God would be deceived. Because you are going to have to deny your eyes. You are going to have to deny your senses. And you have to trust fully on the words of God. And I, although we call ourselves Seventh Day, what? Adventists. The teaching that to me is crucial at this moment is the teaching of the Second Coming. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is that the world at this present moment is being prepared for the sting. The sting that will be so powerful that if in any way you were not grounded in the word as to what truth about the second coming really was, you're going to be caught. In actual fact, I'm counseled in the writings of Ellen White. That God will not allow the devil to imitate his coming in the clouds because that will assure his sting even to the elect. Did you hear me? But if there was a world that is ready for the coming of Christ, it is now. 
When I look around me and I look at the wars and rumors of wars, I just heard in the prayer how we're praying for people. These are signs which are birth pains announcing what? The coming of Christ. That's what the word teaches me. So when you see the wars between Ukraine and Russia, dear friends, these are birth pains. The next greatest event to take place on planet Earth is not going to be plagues and earthquakes and famines. It's not going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. The next great event to be announced on planet Earth is the second coming. But prior to the second coming, there will be a counterfeit. And if the world was ever ready for a counterfeit, it's ready. In actual fact, everybody is looking at the East. Everybody is looking at what's happening in Israel. Everybody is looking at what's happening between Ukraine and Russia. Everybody is focused there. We even have Christians saying, this is preparation for the battle of Armageddon. Christians are saying it. And what are they expecting? I mean, they want to build the walls of Jerusalem. They want to rebuild the temple. Why? Because the word of God teaches in Ezekiel and in Isaiah and in the minor prophets, teaches that the one, the Messiah, will come to the temple. And the only reason why they want to build the temple is because they reject that the Christ who did come was in actual fact the Messiah. That Jesus was the Christ. Now, just keep your finger there. I want to show you something, dear friends. Go with me to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Now, Acts is all about the written historical record of what the early Christian leaders spoke about. Now, Acts chapter 9, most of you will know, was the chapter where we find the conversion of Saul, who then became Paul. Do you remember that? But I want you to notice something about Saul. The most incredible thing about Saul, won't you please go with me to verse 17. Now, before I do that, remember, he was persecuting who? Not Christians. The followers of the way. Who were the followers of the way? Who were the followers of the way? It was those who followed Jesus Christ who was the way, the truth and the life. Their first title was people of the way. Not Christians. They were known as Christians in... Antioch. So what I want you to understand... People were known to be people of the way. And Paul says, I persecuted people of the way. And he was on his journey with letters to persecute people of the way. When while he was riding on his donkey, a light struck him. But I want you to notice, God says, listen to me dear friends, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Now, who's, who's talking to him? Now, I like what Paul does. He asks a question. Who's talking to me? Who are you, Lord? Verse 5. The Lord replies, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What is the most amazing thing about this now? is Paul did not acknowledge Christ as Lord. He saw him as an imposter. He saw him as somebody who was a fraud. He saw him as somebody who was committing blasphemy. But here this blasphemous person cries out from heaven, Saul, Saul. Now whenever you hear the word Saul, Saul, it's again drawing his attention to something he doesn't see, although he's seen. And dear friends, listen to me. The world is about to experience a Saul Saul. Because what is about to happen is not really what you th think it's going to be. 
I want you to notice a little bit further on verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered, placing his hands on Saul. This is when God told him, go Ananias to Saul. And he says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus. Notice he actually adds on Jesus. Because who was it that spoke to Ananias? It was Jesus. Who appeared to you on the road. As you were coming here to, to, to persecute us. He sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, I want you to notice two things important here. You need to see again. We are blind and we need ourselves so that we can see again. And we need the Holy Spirit. Listen to verse 18. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. 1 Corinthians 9. You're going to jump around with me. 1 Corinthians 9. We have this story of Paul speaking again. And he says these words in 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not free? Verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Then he says these words. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Here Paul is clearly saying that he was blind but now he sees. He was blind to the fact of who Jesus was but now it was clear to him Jesus was Lord, God's anointed, the Messiah. I want you to go back to Acts chapter 9. And I want you to notice that Paul's first duty as he went around was to proclaim. And I want you to look at verse 22 of Acts chapter 9. Listen to Paul's first witnessing, first ministry, whenever he had the opportunity. Listen to what he preached on. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by doing what? Proving that Jesus is the Messiah. You get that? What was Paul's main objective? Was to, to tell the world that this Jesus who was given the name by Gabriel to Mary and Joseph, was in actual fact the promised Messiah. And Paul, without question, draws scripture to draw our attention that this Jesus was the Christ, was the Messiah. And it says there that they could not argue with him. His, his argument was clear. Dear friends, how is it possible that in the world we are living in, people are expecting a Messiah? Do you know that the Messiah is expected in the Hindu faith? The Messiah is expected in the Muslim faith? The Messiah is expected in the um, Jewish faith? And sadly, I see that some Christians are expecting the Messiah. Which means they've rejected Christ as the Messiah. Or that Jesus is going to come and be the Messiah again. But what did Jesus say to Caiaphas? The next time you see me, I will not be the Lamb. I will not be the Messiah. You will see me coming in power and great glory, sitting at the right hand of my Father. You see, Jesus has come and he has already been the Messiah. The temple did serve its purpose, but it is destroyed as it was prophesied. But now the world, and particularly the Christian world, wants to rebuild it. For what purpose? 
because the greatest con is about to take place. If there was a world that needs healing, if there was a world that needs direction, if there was a world that needs comfort, if there was a world that needs the blessing hands of Jesus, it is this world. And when the devil comes and imitates this blessing of Christ, where he, he says the words of the Beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, he is going to present the greatest con ever. He's going to bring people, so we think, back to life. Loved ones who have been lost. Diseased people are going to be healed. And because of the miraculous signs that he performs, the world will wonder after the beast. Are you ready for that? Let's round off. Go back to 2 Peter. I'm asking you again, what will you say? When this person stands up and performs his miracles, are you going to say, behold the Christ, the Son of God, who takes away the sins and the, the diseases of the world? What are you going to say? I once preached a sermon, I just vowed never to preach it again. I preached a sermon that was so cunningly put together that every single person listening to me thought I was preaching about Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. They were full of hallelujah, praising God, all of that. And in the end I revealed that it was the devil I had just lifted up. And what he was going to do, they were shocked. Now, if I could so easily have influenced people to think that the person I was presenting was Christ, how masterful do you think the devil's going to be? He is going to imitate light. He's going to imitate Christ to the T. He's going to say the, the way that you even in your thoughts think about Jesus, he's going to present the persona for one purpose, to get you to bow to him. Are you ready? The reason why it hasn't happened is because we're not ready. Go back with me to 2 Peter. And I'm asking you this question, what are you going to say? 2 Peter chapter 1. Are you eyewitnesses? Or are you going to listen to cleverly devised stories about the coming of Christ? Did you hear me? You see, Peter makes it very clear, but we were eyewitnesses, verse 16, of his majesty... He received, not to receive, he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Then he says this, We, this is Peter, James and John, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Now why Jesus felt the need to do that, he needed three witnesses. I'm counted clearly in the word of God that you need two or three witnesses to an event. He chooses three. Peter, James and John. To be witnesses to this event that Christ said is going to take place. In the second coming. But Peter doesn't say come into planet earth and then come in just to stay and make his dwelling amongst us. No, he's coming to what? According to John 14, what's he coming to do? He's coming to fetch us who are ready.
are you ready?